Hello and welcome to Ink and Bourbon. I'm Patrick LeClerc and today we're going to talk a little bit about sword fighting. Specifically we're going to talk about um, simulated sword fighting. Um, sparring, fencing, historical European martial arts, SCA, all that kind of stuff. All the kind of um, sword based martial arts and sports that people tend to get involved in. So this channel, um, I intended it basically for two crowds, kind of a writing crowd and um, people interested in sword play. So this kind of applies to both of them. So we're going to talk a little bit about the different um, styles of um, fencing. I'm going to use fencing as a broad term. Fencing is going to be simulated swordsmanship where you um, want to practice and, and, and spar um, with some kind of simulated weapon and you don't want to hurt your friends as opposed to fighting where you're trying to actually hurt somebody and it's for real. So I'm going to use the term fencing to apply to all of it just because that's the best catch-all term. So there's two things to remember. Um, all fencing is fake, and all fencing has value. So what do I mean by that? So any kind of simulated sword, sword fight, if you want to do it and you want to see what you can learn from it, you can always take something from it. And if, you, if you're a writer and you want to experience a sword fight in order to write a more realistic um, thing to understand what a person feels like, to understand some of the different moves and how things work. It's great if you're just a history nerd and you want to see how historical swords actually were used, um, then physically using them is going to give you a lot of information. Maybe you already, maybe you already fence, maybe you already do the SCA, Society of Creative Anachronism, maybe you already do historical European martial arts. Maybe you already do some of that stuff, kendo. But uh, so this is going to talk about all of them and how they all have some value. One of the things that we see a lot in these hobbies is a certain snobbery about our own fencing and how our fencing is a real art and that guy's fencing is fake. It's all fake. Uh, <laughs> and the reason it's all fake, it's all fake for a very good reason. And that's we don't want to kill our friends. Um, so if you want to have some kind of sparring, some kind of simulated sword fight, you ideally want to make it safe enough that you can do it and nobody gets hurt, nobody has to go to the ER, everybody can go to work tomorrow and live their lives. So there's a couple ways you can do that and all of these turn it into a little bit of an abstraction. Um, you can... So none of it is, is going to give you a true picture of sword fighting. But that doesn't matter. So the reason it's an abstraction is we have to do things to make it safe. And there's a couple ways we can make it safer. The first one is we can make the weapon less deadly. Um, and that's pretty straightforward. The second way is we can, make, we can wear a lot more protection than people wore during that time period when facing that kind of weapon. So if the weapon's not made safer, then you need a lot more gear. The third thing we can do is we can use the rules. Um, we, it, all of these can be kind of a sport, a game, an activity. There are certain things that are off limits that would not be off limits in a real fight. So let's talk about some examples. Uh, I'm going to start with some really safe end of it, and I'm going to work up towards the more, um, more involved end of it. So this, <coughs> this is a boffer sword. This is one my son used to use when he went to um, like a little, little kid fantasy role-playing um, place where they'd play games and they'd play characters and they'd go on adventures. So this is a boffer sword. It's foam, it's flexible. It's foam padded. It's got a, um, I want to say nylon sleeve on it, so it's not even abrasive. This is crazy safe. Um, 
and you can use it, you can hit your friends with it, not really hurt anybody. The great thing about it is you can use it and you don't really need a whole lot of protective gear. So it's easy to start off with it. You don't have to spend a lot of money. You can buy this, buy two of them, relatively cheap. You and your buddy can go out in the backyard and beat each other up and nobody's gonna get hurt. So that's the plus. The downside is it's only kind of sword-like. Um, it's a lot lighter. It moves a lot quicker. It's a cylinder, so it doesn't have an edge. It doesn't have a flat, which changes the way you'd use it. But it gives you an idea. So the value for this, you can still learn about distance and timing. And in theory, the moves that you use to block a cut that came at you, you know, how to attack your opponent, what areas are vulnerable. If you stand a certain way and you don't realize, oh wow, I'm leaving my, I'm leaving my elbow open. I didn't, I didn't think of that. It's gonna tell you something about sword fighting, even though this is only a vaguely sword-like object. So is it real fighting? No. But can it give us some insight? Absolutely. And there's a lot of value to that. Um, and again, depends what you're, what you're trying to get out of it. If, like I said, if you're a writer, and you want to play around something really quick to see what maybe make your fight scene seem a little more realistic, grab two of these. You can get two of these for under a hundred bucks. Get a friend, ambush a friend, jump when they're not looking. Um, you can buy a couple of these, leave them in the trunk of your car if anybody else talks about, yeah, I always wondered about sword fighting. I'm like, dude, we can go in the parking lot right now. That's the advantage of this. You don't need anything else. And it's a lot of fun. Um, so that's a very simulated end of it. This is a very safe, very different from the real thing, but there's still a lot of value to it. So then we can look at um, what we think of when you say fencing, like fencing in the Olympics, collegiate fencing, something like that. This is a fencing foil. It's very light. Got a blunt tip, very flexible. It is steel. Um, because it's got a blunt tip and because it flexes, you're not gonna stab anybody with it. Um, but it does require some more, a few more rules and some more protective gear because it's a pointy stick. It's a metal stick. You're gonna have to wear a fencing mask, a canvas jacket, a glove, and usually only a glove on the sword hand because the way fencing is practiced, you keep your, your not sword hand back out of the way. So I'm not gonna get hit in this back hand, probably. So, um, it's fast, it teaches you technique, it's a lot of fun, it's a great workout. It's not exactly sword fighting. This is really light. Uh, compared to an, an actual sword, even the, the small sword that this would have been kind of based on. Um, and the rules are such that they're there for safety's sake, they're there to reinforce uh, certain training behaviors, and it's a sport. Uh, there's no, no biting, no shoving, no wrestling, that kind of thing. But it's, it's a real steel sword, the advantage of having a steel sword is when steel swords come into contact, they act in a certain way. Where a foam swords will kind of bounce off each other, steel swords kind of stick a little bit. Um, if you're trying to learn any of the kind of um, sword contact things with binds and disengages and, and, and things like that, steel is gonna teach you a little better. Downside is you need some more protective gear. Um, but still, that's on the cheaper end. Because like I said, it's a canvas jacket, it's a mask, it's a glove. And there's a lot of fencing studios around. It's fairly widely available. Most colleges have fencing. Some high schools have fencing. A lot of towns have fencing. So if you're interested in getting into sword fighting, you probably can find a fencing club within spitting distance more easily than you could find other forms. Um, so that's a foil. I'm gonna show you a fencing saber. This is a fencing saber. Same thing that they would use in the Olympics. It's, with the foil, um, 
the rules are such that you only can score touches with the point with the tip. The saber, you can score touches with the edge as well as the tip. Again, this is blunt, it's very flexible, it's dull, and it's crazy light. Um, because you don't want to be swinging a big heavy object at your friends uh, with just a canvas jacket on. Um, it's fast, it's fun, it's a great workout. It's only a little sword-like because this is so light, it can move so much different than a, a traditional historical saber. But you do, it, you get the distance, you get the timing, the guards and the, um, the areas that you cover relate to real sword fighting. So again, it's something that you can do, you can enjoy, you can do it relatively on a budget. And it's, it's interesting, it's exciting. The third weapon in what I'm going to call Olympic style fencing is this. This is an epee. It's a heavy blade. It's a bigger guard. This is the most like a small sword in physical dimensions. It's still to be used with a point only. It's not nearly as flexible as the foil. It's a heavier cross section. It's a heavier blade with a triangular cross section. Um, and so apart from being blunt, it's pretty similar to a small sword blade. It weighs about the same. It acts the same when you parry or guard, or guard with it. So the blade is similar to a small sword. A small sword is not a rapier. A small sword is a thin dueling sword with no real edge. That's what this was based off of. Um, so the weapon is pretty realistic. The rules are not. It's got rules. You are confined to a fencing strip. Um, there's a lot of timing rules about when things happen that it's, it's going to teach you a lot about how to use your blade to do parries and do, tip, do point control and control somebody's blade. But again, it's, it's not war. Um, but it's a lot of fun. So that's... Olympic style fencing, collegiate style fencing. <clears throat> Again, pretty low bar to get into it. Relatively inexpensive. A lot of fencing clubs have loaner gear because they're used to students coming in. So if you're interested in introductory sword fighting, fencing is a great way to go. Um, you will learn a lot. You will learn a lot of technique. You'll get. You'll learn tip control. You'll learn distance and timing. But again, it's a little artificial. You're confined to a strip, and there's a lot of rules. And that's fine, because again, we're safe, but we're learning something. Um, some of the other people who do other kinds of sword fighting think that fencing is a sport, it's not, a, it's not combat. That's true. But their stuff's not combat either. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. Uh, I'm going to talk about HEMA. So historical European martial arts, which is exactly what it sounds like. This grew up, um, really took off more recently um, and has grown in popularity a lot. And as a lot of it's due to the rise of the internet where now people can get access to um, old fashioned, oh, not old fashioned, old historical fencing treatise, treatises and see how they were actually used in the day and how, how sword fighting was taught and now that you can talk to somebody on the other side of the world, there's a lot more cross-pollinization of, of ideas. And we're seeing a lot more of this stuff. And so some of the weapons that they use, there's a couple different ways they do it. This is a synthetic saber. It's basically plastic. The weight is remarkably close to a real historic saber. The balance is pretty close. Um, it is plastic. It's plastic's obviously lighter than steel, but this is a lot thicker, which does two things. It it's able to imitate the weight, and it also gives a broad um, edge. So if you hit somebody with it, it's not going to cut because you're distributing that force over a wider area. So that's all good. It moves kind of like a saber, like a historical saber. Um, the rules are less confined. You're not confined to a strip. Um, where it's <clears throat> less, and 
where the the downsides of it is you need so as opposed to this saber this is a lot more realistic but if you're using this you need a lot more gear um because it's it's heavy not heavy heavy but it's a lot heavier if you get hit with this thing at speed um you need a, a, a better mask better head protection you want some protection better gloves because if you get whacked in the fingers with this you could, you could get hurt, you could break a finger. Um, if you get hit in your elbows, knees, anything like that, it can hurt. It's not that flexible, so if you were to get a thrust, it can hurt you. Um, so you need more padding, you need more gear, you need some actual rigid protection. So once you jump up to this, you're spending a lot more money on protection, but you're getting a closer to accurate um, experience of a sword fight. The other unrealistic thing about this, so two things, it's, it's blunt and it's plastic. Um, blunt swords don't act the same as sharp swords when they hit each other. Sharp swords kind of bite into each other and stick a little bit. Blunt swords bounce off each other. Plastic doesn't bind as well. So if you're trying to do a move where you're trying to take their blade and push it aside and kind of bind it or... or um, control it plastic swords tend to bounce off each other more than steel steel tends to be stickier so it gives you it doesn't do as realistic a job with that kind of movement the thing about a saber is the sabers really didn't weren't used to bind um and do complicated blade control stuff that that much they were used to you, you cut you parried you return to cut so this works pretty well for that so again it's a lot of fun. Um, it's a little more investment. You need a little more protection. So you're spending a little bit more money. Um, you're getting hit a little harder. But you can learn more. And again, I love this. This is my, this is my favorite thing to play with. Because it's still on the, the, the safe end of it because it's plastic and blunt. But feels like a saber, moves like a saber. It's a good time. So from there, in historical European martial arts, you may move up to a steel sword. This is a steel, Hema, broadsword, side sword. Um, it's kind of big and heavy for a side sword, so I'd call it more of a broadsword, but it is, it's steel. It, the weight is roughly the same as a historical sword. Um, it moves and balances very similar to a historical sword. It's blunt. It's got a blunt end. It's got no edge. So this is, this is a flat piece of steel. There's no, it doesn't bevel down towards the edge. The edge of this is pretty thick. It's not going to cut, really. Um, it's not very flexible. So if you were to thrust with this, it's going to put all the force into you. It's blunt. It's not, not going to put a point in you, but you're getting all that force. If you get hit, again, it's not getting hit with an edge, but you're getting hit with all that weight of steel. So if you use these, you're going to have to invest in some really decent protection. Um, definitely things in your joints, elbows, knees, um, knuckles, hands, your head, your throat. You're going to need some rigid protection on that. For your, your soft tissue, you're going to want a padded, padded jacket of some sort. Um, if I get hit in the chest with this, it's not going to injure me, but it's going to bruise me. Um, so again, I'll teach you a lot. It's very sword-like. That's the advantage of it. The disadvantage is um, you're going to pay more in gear. You're going to pay more in bruises. So just be aware. So again, it's more like war. It's still not war. The reason it's still not war, it's blunt. These things aren't going to parry the same. They're not going to stick when they hit each other the same way sharp swords would. The advantage of not having sharp swords is you don't go to jail after you fight your buddy and you both can go to work the next day. Nobody bleeds to death. So it's pretty safe. <coughs> so those are the things that I have generally done. Um, things that I haven't really done, but I know a lot of people who do. Um, the Society for Creative Anachronism, they fight in 
they try to imitate, um, or, or not imitate, that's not the right word, but try to um, emulate medieval combat. So they wear much more armor, um, like kind of some plate armor. They use heavier weapons. Their weapons are made of rattan. Uh, so they hit with a lot of force, uh, which means you need heavier armor. You need a realistic size shield. But again, it's not war because it's a rattan stick. It's a cylinder. It doesn't have an edge. It doesn't have a flat. So if you're swinging something around at somebody, what it doesn't teach you is how to line up your edge. Um, edge alignment is really important if you want to actually give a good cut. And I'm not talking about just hitting somebody with a flat instead of the edge. I'm talking about you hit at a... If I hit with this at a slight angle, if I head on, this would cut. If I'm at all tilted, if this was a real sword, it wouldn't cut, it'd bounce off. You can kind of tell that with this. You can kind of tell that with this. Um, if you're swinging a cylinder at somebody and you hit them, instead of a straight 90 degree angle that you want, if you hit them at a 60 degree angle, nobody's going to know. You're going to get credit for that hit, which is fine. But it's not war. Also, when two swords hit each other, it matters if you hit edge to edge or edge to flat. Uh, if everything's a cylinder, there's no edge, there's no flat. It's all nothing. So it's, it's not exactly the same. There's also, they have some very sensible safety rules that, again, provide another abstraction. There are places you can't hit people. You can't hit people in the knees. You can't hit people in the crotch. And the reason for that is, like I said, we want to be able to walk the next day. So it's a, it's a sensible safety precaution, but it's another layer of abstraction. So I'm not suggesting that you avoid the abstraction. I'm suggesting that if that's your sport, Understand it's a sport. Don't tell the guy who's doing collegiate fencing or kendo or LARP or the foam sword that his stuff isn't real and yours is, because none of them are real. Um, speaking of non-Western sources, this this is a bokken. This is used to practice um, katana forms, Japanese sword forms. It's rare that people fight with this because it's a stick. It's like getting hit with a club. It literally is. But some people practice forms um, together. So it's less open sparring where you're trying to hit somebody and more practice of, all right, I'm going to swing this at you and you're going to make the expected block so we learn how the, how the weapons work together. Again, it's similar weight, moves like a katana, feels like a katana, but we have to have that layer of abstraction to be safe. Um, the sparring that's done in Japanese style sword play. Um, and I'm not an expert on the terms, but Kendo, Yaido, Kenjutsu, they usually use a Shinai, which is um, like, I'm not sure it's bamboo or rattan, but it's, it's wood, it's, it's flexible. So you can hit your, your friends with it fairly safely. Again, there are rules, there are uh, safety measures taken that make it not a fight. But again, but again, we can learn from it. So, here's the question. What should I do? Or, uh, which of these are most worthwhile? And the answer to that is all personal preference. It's what do you want out of it? And what area is your, your uh, area of interest? So, are you just looking to have fun and goof around a little bit? Um, are you just looking to get some exercise? Are you looking to do a sport that you can compete in and win medals? Um, are you want, do you want to understand a specific kind of weapon? Do you want to understand how a rapier works? Um, I actually have a rapier. I have a sparring rapier. So this again, you can see how it's wider and heavier than the epee, because the epee was, imitates a small sword, this imitates a rapier. Rapiers were longer and heavier than small swords. They had some edge. They, had a, they could have a more developed guard. This is blunt. It's flexible. Um, you can go spar rapier style with this. You can go play D'Artagnan. It's a lot of fun. So pick the kind of sword fighting you want to do. 
or the kind of sword fighting that's available in your area, or the kind of sword fighting you can afford. None of those are wrong. They're all going to tell you something. After you do it, you're going to know more than you did before, which is great. Um, and things that you read about or you've seen movies, it doesn't really explain to you all the intricacies that you're suddenly going to understand when you hold the thing, when you actually try to defend yourself. You're like, wow, it is really hard to block that attack coming from that angle. Or I'm getting hit in the hand a lot. Nobody gets hit in the hand in, in the movies. Nobody gets hit in the hand in books. But if my hand's out here holding my sword, defending myself, yeah, I guess I got to learn some different techniques. I guess I, I didn't realize how vulnerable that is. It's, that's all valuable stuff. Um, so my advice is keep an open mind. I wouldn't discourage anybody from doing any kind of, of, of um, sword training, of, of fencing. Um, find the one that you like, the one that fits your, your lifestyle. And absolutely, go out there, mix it up, beat your friends with sticks, have fun. Um, and if you're ever in the New Hampshire area, send me a message and uh, we'll come fight. All right, thanks very much. Um, generally new content on Tuesdays. If you like this kind of thing, like and subscribe. And hopefully I will see you next week. Thank you for putting up with my uh, ramblings. Hope to see you on the strip. <laughs>